Hi, this is the Golden Salamander with a Dreams tutorial on how to set up a turn-based strategy system, uh, game movement system. Thanks to Gennaro here, Starts, who suggested this tutorial. As you can see, this is on the Dreamiverse. Uh, just look for it in the description. Um, let's jump straight in and see how this works. So we've got um, pressing the X button highlights uh, the destination that uh, you want to move to and it's just directional buttons to move around and the player moves automatically once you've selected the destination. Um, player also chooses intelligently between multiple available pathways. It can't go on black squares and it can't move more than five spaces. You can adapt this and make it less than five or more than five. There's a lot of logic involved and this is just one possible method, but I'll give you the main concept. So think of it like this, between the player's starting position and its destination are these yellow squares. And when we choose the destination, we're going to assign a number to each of those squares. Let's say we choose this square as the destination, the one that's highlighted. It's two squares away from the player, so the shortest path is two. Then we'll give this square in between a value of two. But if we choose this square as the destination, the one that's highlighted, then the shortest path is four, then each square between the player and the destination will get a value of four. There may be more than one path to the destination, but each square, <coughs> excuse me, will only be given a single value based on the shortest path that this square belongs to. The idea is that the player will reach its destination by following a trail of fours or threes or whatever. And if you understand that, then the rest is just figuring out how to make this work. So let's jump in, turn off preview invisibility so we can see hidden objects. Let's reset it and I'll just turn on the grid as well. The way this works is with three interconnected systems. The first is what I'll call the selection system. This includes a grid of yellow walkable squares and a selector, which is the orange group, which chooses which square you want the player to move towards. Second is the pathfinding system, which is the white group and the red group that you can see, which figures out the different paths. And finally, there's the movement system, which is the green group, which actually moves the player to the destination that you've chosen. Let's look at the three systems in detail. Each system has two components. The selection system has the yellow squares and a selector, which is the orange group. Each of the yellow squares has the same microchip, so you can clone them and arrange them however you like, so long as it's in a grid and the black squares can't be used by the player. Let's take a look at the selector first. This is an invisible group of objects. If you scope in, you see that it's got four tags. Uh, directional tags. And we're just going to use these to teleport the whole group one space at a time in that direction make sure these tags are right in the center of the block. If we open up the uh, microchip of the selector. Okay. The logic on the right, this stuff, is what makes the selector move. For each direction, it uses a trigger zone to check for the label called object. Object. 
and each yellow square has the object label but the black squares don't so it can only move into a yellow square and an AND gate here is hooked up to this bright green microchip so this is checking for other button presses um, if the player presses two directional buttons at once we don't want the selector to try and move in both directions so these not gates are wired to the three other directional buttons and if we get a clean button press then the signal manipula manipulator uh, pulses a signal to the teleporter we only want to use a pulse so a pulse uh, otherwise it's going to try and keep teleporting down here we send a message when the destination is um, selected and another message when the player's move is finished. Uh, there's a third message in this microchip uh, to tell the player that it can move. And this is checking for these tags, P one, two, three, four, and five, or the player. The destination is selected when the X button is pressed and when we detect the friend label. Uh, I'll explain this uh, later, but this is helping to make sure that the player doesn't move more than five spaces. And in fact, I'll explain it now because the friend label is showing up here. All of these white squares have the friend label attached. At the same time, we are setting off a timer set to 0.8 seconds to allow some other logic to happen elsewhere. And this set of trigger zones, as I mentioned briefly, is looking for tags, which I'm going to explain when we get to the pathfinding system. When we detect the player, we know that the move is finished. So that's the player. Um, and once we detect the player, we reset this timer. Now let's look at the microchips on these yellow squares. There are two main actions that take place on these microchips. This keyframe on the left is the one that highlights the square to let you know where the selector is. So it just looks for the selector tag in the tree zone. Secondly, if you've selected this square as the destination, it activates an emitter. And the emitter, this is a little confusing because it looks like it's emitting this white group of squares, but that's just the um, color. It's actually emitting the red group. So um, that is a little confusing that it looks like this white group but it emits the red group and I'm going to explain that shortly. If the player moves here, then the turn must be finished. So we destroy the emitted object. So that destroys this emitted object um, because we only want one in the scene at a time. Uh, finally, this stuff over here on the right hand side is a little embarrassing because it doesn't seem to do anything. Um, the transmitter can be removed without any effect on the system. Uh, in fact, all of this can be removed except these trigger zones. Um, if you remove these trigger zones, it doesn't work. 
which is strange because um, once you take all of these out, they are not wired up to anything. So it is strange, but um, I must have needed that at some point when I was developing the system. They don't seem to do anything now, so um, but it's probably best just to leave these uh, trigger zones there uh, because they do seem to be needed for some reason. Anyway, that's it for the selector. Now we're moving on to the pathfinding system. Uh, two components, the red and the white. Um, the red group is emitted when you select the destination. So imagine the destination being in the middle of the group. And we also have the white group, which is following the player around. And it's got a microchip here to do that. So it's teleporting to the player. Actually, whenever the player is not moving, it teleports to the player because we don't want it to continuously follow it around. We want the red and the white groups to sort of work together to tell us which yellow squares link up to make a pathway and to give those squares a value up to five. So that's what the pathfinding system is doing. On the one hand, the red group counts from a yellow square to the destination. And on the other hand, the white group counts from the same yellow square to the player. And then you just add those numbers together. Let's look at the red group. The microchips are very simple. Let's open one up. So we've got a trigger zone and it's checking for the object label and if it finds it, it's going to activate this uh, tag, which is called D1 on this microchip. Um, this is a D1 because it's only one step from the middle. Uh, if we look at this one, it's two steps away, so it's a D2. And this one is also a D2 because the player can move um, up, down, left and right, but not diagonally. Uh, and that is it for the red group. On to the white group, which is much more complicated. Uh, and this is going to find the distance to the player, but then it adds this value to the number on the red square tag, so that D1 or D2 or whatever number it is. And this gives us the total distance between the player and the destination. If the destination is greater than 5, then the player, sorry, the distance is greater than 5, then the player can't get there. The white squares have the friend label, which I've mentioned. Uh, let's have a look at the microchips, which I've color coded according to their distance from the center. So the yellow ones are one step away, two, three, four, five. Um, we'll open up the yellow one. Bit messy. A lot to cover here. Um, apart from the color, the only difference between these microchips is this value slider. So this one, because the microchip is only one step away from the middle, it's got a value of one. If we look at this one right on the end, it's got a value of five. So we've got five, four, three, two, one. Now, the value slider is going to send uh, this value of 1 through this calculator. What these trigger zones do, so they've got a value of D1, D2, D3, D4. 
I've wired them up to counters and this target value it doesn't mean anything it can be a very high number but this is the important number here the current count so this is a one this is a two this is a three and this is a four um, and these are going to be feeding into this calculator so they're adding to this value here so you might get a one plus um, a four or a three or a two or a one and then this calculator then goes into um, get the result of adding those two numbers together and if it's a two then it's going to activate this p2 tag and if it's a three you get the p3 and so on up to p5 The reason we don't need a P1 is if the player is only one square away from the destination, we're just going to move there straight away. So uh, we're just saving on a bit of logic there. Let's say that a P3 gets activated. That means the player can move to the destination in three steps. And then any other square with a P3 tag also becomes part of a par play to the destination. And what we're going to do is use these P tags um, to create like a trail of breadcrumbs, let's say, from the player to the destination. And to help with this, we'll also turn off any P tags that don't belong to that trail. In other words, there might be a square with a three next to the player, but if there's no threes next to that square, then the trail of breadcrumbs ends and we want to get rid of these dead ends so that the player doesn't even consider them. So each square to qualify as a breadcrumb needs to be next to at least two other breadcrumbs. And that is what we're doing in this kind of area here. So there needs to be one before and one after this breadcrumb. The one before it can either be another breadcrumb or it can be the player's starting position. And the one after it can be either another breadcrumb or the destination. So we've got more calculations uh, going on here. They're very simple uh, addition, but the probably the most important one is this one. And the A input at the top is how many breadcrumbs are next to this square. And there have to be at least two or greater than one um, for this to work. Now let's say that the square we're on at the moment has an active P3 tag, which means it's part of a three-step par play. We only want to check for other P3 tags close by, or the destination itself, or the player's starting point, which is the origin. So the P3 microchip checks for P3 tags, left, right, up and down. Uh, I had wanted to use a counter to count up each of these individual um, tags as they are detected, but a counter doesn't work. It gets up to one and then uh, anything else just uh, gets stuck. So instead of a counter we're using a calculator and this looks very messy because we've got a lot of stuff that's wired up to this calculator uh, and we've got signal manipulators going from the 
trigger zones into the calculator. I've also set off these trigger zones one after the other. So the first one is instantaneous, but then there's this series of very quick timers. So 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 seconds, um, just so they're not all jamming up the system at once. Um, okay, so the if, a, if another P3 tag is detected, we send a pulse and the pulse goes into the B input of the calculator to say that we've detected a, a P3 tag. And each time we detect one, we add another one to this uh, calculator. And you might not be able to see it very well but this is looped back into the A input uh, so that each time we detect another one, it adds to the result here. Uh, up here, we are checking for the origin or the selector tag. Um, and there's an origin tag in the center of the white group of squares. That's why that works. Um, and I'll just show you, this is the trigger zone for these uh, triggers. And you can see we just need one trigger zone. If you make a square zone of the right size and then rotate it, uh, you'll be able to detect any tag to the left, right, up or down, but not diagonally. Um, if we do not detect an origin tag or a selector tag and no P tags either next to the square that we're on, or if we only find one tag, then it's a dead end because we need one on either side or we need, we need at least two. It doesn't have to be to the left and the right. It just needs to be next to this square. Um, and so what happens if we don't have uh, two other breadcrumbs next to this one? We activate this keyframe, which turns off these trigger zones so that the whole system can't progress. And this is going to turn off these P tags, um, but there are a couple of conditions for this to happen. Uh, it only works if we've selected a destination. So that's uh, this receiver here, but also we don't want the player to be moving while we're doing these checks. So that's the the player moves, we've got that hooked up to a knock gate as well. Or rather, we want the, the checks to be made before the player tries to move anywhere. Um, there's a timer here as well, set to about half a second. And then these counters are really just storing bits of information. Uh, and when the move is finished, we reset them. Up here, if, the, if this square turns out to be a proper breadcrumb, we want to deactivate it if we detect the player. Why we do this is because we, if the player is moving along a pathway, we don't ever want it to go backwards. So it's as if the player is picking up a breadcrumb as it goes along, and uh, that way it won't get lost and try to return to a square that it's already been to. Finally, down here, we need to make sure that we take the quickest path, path to our destination 
In some cases, there'll be more than one way to get there. Um, and what these two keyframes do is ignore one pathway if it will take longer than another pathway. So we've got this ignore P4 and ignore P5. And the keyframes turn off the appropriate calculators over here. So I'll just, so the P4 and the P5 calculator so that we don't end up turning on P4 and P5. So if there's a path that takes three steps, that means there may also be one that takes five steps. Um, that's just how it works with um, grids and grid movement. And also if a path takes two steps, there could also be a path that takes four steps to get to that same destination. If you expanded this system and allowed more than five steps per, per turn, you'd probably need more of these um, checks to happen. And when the move is finished, we reset these counters. That is all for these microchips. One other thing is this bit of logic here. And this is going to lead into the final system, which is the player movement system. This is detecting the position of the destination. Um, actually detecting the selector tag. Uh, and it's checking these trigger zones. If we sort of open them all up, we can see, hopefully you can see where the different zones that we're checking for. So everything on the left and everything straight down, apart from the ones that are very close to the center, because we're using other logic to check for these. Um, and the trigger zones on the right are checking for, um, to see if the destination is on the right or up. Um, all of this is going to make sure that the player doesn't get lost. If the player can move along two different paths, each of which take, for example, three steps, then we need to automatically choose one of these paths. And the way to do that is to give priority to certain directions. The clockwise check will work if the destination's on the right or directly upwards. But if the destination's on the left or straight down, you need to check in an anti-clockwise um, direction. So finally, we have the player movement system. Uh, the system's made up of a player and a group of objects, which I'm going to call the player proxy, which is the green group. Most of the work here is done by the proxy. And the proxy is using the information provided by the pathfinding system and moving along the correct path. All the player has to do is follow the proxy. Um, we open the player up. It's very simple. It's just got a follower to follow the player and look at the player. And the player tag is on the proxy. All right. I can demonstrate this. If we go into test mode. So I'm going to select this destination and you can see that the, the green uh, proxy teleports instantaneously and the player moves shortly after that. You can also see how the red group is emitted and 
the white group follows the player but only at the end of each turn. Let's look at the logic of the proxy. The proxy is waiting for this signal to say that the player can move. And this receiver gets powered on when the selector is not right on top of it, which I think might be a bit redundant, may not be necessary, so you could probably remove uh, these two gadgets and it would probably still work. In the bottom half here, we're sending out these messages to ignore P4 and P5. So if we detect a P2 or a P3, we want to ignore any uh, paths that are um, two, two more than the path that we've detected. So a P3 is going to um, be easier to get to than a P5, or a distance of 3 is shorter than a distance of 5. Up here we've got some logic to check if the player is right next to the destination. If you are next to the destination, then it's going to teleport you straight there. Uh, if, if not, it's going to um, activate this. So if you remember those, all those trigger zones that we're checking if the destination was on the left or the right or up or down, that's what this is about. So we get that, uh, we receive that message and we send, we're, we're toggling this signal which is what seems to work. And if we get this uh, message, then we're going into this logic, which is the anti-clockwise checking. And otherwise we go into the clockwise check. Um, let's open it up and it's actually a set of four microchips. Let's open one up. We've got more trigger zones here checking for p tags if no p tags are detected then there's no path in that particular direction these are this is left right up and down directions and if a p tag is detected then that go feeds up here and eventually it's going to teleport the proxy in that direction. This passes through a very short timer of 0.2 seconds which gives us a little pause between each of the player's steps. You can adjust that if you want. It then goes through a selector gadget. I found that this selector was necessary to create a separation between um, each of the, t the checks for tags so that it doesn't just keep teleporting. So it defaults to a blank A output and the B output is the thing that actually does the teleporting, uh, which goes via a signal pulse. Um, I'll just keep that open. The reason for these other signal manipulators is to reset the selector. So you can see these are going through this wire here to reset it to its A position at the start of each turn. And that's it. Hopefully I've explained this in a way that's not too complicated, but even just listening to myself uh, do this is uh, confusing me. So if you have any questions, or suggestions if there's a simple way to do all this um, I would love to know how to do it uh, just leave a comment and I'll try my best to respond thank you and I'll see you next time